we are um, in the middle of a series we started last week that is called Questions Without Answers. And, and, and what we decided to do in this uh, particular series, because of the cultural questions that we, we tend to be having and the conversations we're having nowadays around specific topics, and we had to kind of narrow it down to just a few, um, we wanted to kind of look at you know, some of the questions. And it's not because the questions don't have answers. It's the fact that there seems to be a problem coming up with an answer to some of the questions and conversations we're having. That, that there seems to be these multiple, kind of like, well, this is an answer to this, this is an answer to that. Last week we talked specifically about racism uh, in our country and the new face of racism and how we need to understand uh, all the language that's being kind of talked about and how we as a church are, are kind of called to respond in the, midst, uh, in the midst of that. And so today will be very, very similar. Uh, today's conversation is going to be around the LGBTQ conversation, just in case you have any young kids in here and you didn't know that's what it was going to be about today. Um, we're going to be doing that today and, um, and kind of looking at, again, those questions from the perspective, obviously, what we feel like God wants us, calls us to, to see and calls us to respond in those conversations with our friends and family, okay? Here's some of the questions, just to throw out a few, uh, in terms of some of the questions I feel like are, as I kind of do searches that are kind of culturally driven questions right now, uh, can we be born? with a different sexual identity. This is a conversation right now happening in the transgender world of can we have a different sexual identity than a biological uh, identity. Um, Is having same-sex attraction a sin? And this is, again, part of maybe the church conversation. Uh, People outside the church don't really care, but in the church they're kind of having this conversation and people have different opinions and different answers for that. Does HB2 allow or promote discrimination? You can't be in North Carolina and not have a conversation about HB2. Um, Right now, especially, especially as we get towards election time, and we will be talking about politics. That's the discussion topic for next week. So I know all you guys are excited about that. We're going to be talking about that next week. Um, but, you know, does it allow or promote discrimination? I mean, I, you know, there, there's an argument to be said for some of the things that it has. Um, is having transgender identity, you know, is it an issue of behavior? And that's where it gets into, again, church conversation. Is sin a behavior? Is sin a, a mindset? Is sin an identity? You know, and that becomes an issue, for, especially for transgender. Uh, does the HB2 uh, kind of bathroom law endanger men, women, and children? I watched a Facebook ad this week about some, you know, guy walking in behind a girl in the bathroom. And, you know, the video is basically like, yeah, no, I don't want that either. You know, it's like, I don't want any of that. Um, but there seems to be this kind of constant tension, especially around the topic of transgender, North Carolina, the HB2 law, um, the essence in terms of, uh, of what does the church, how does the church see and view uh, homosexuality, transgender, identity, behavior, lifestyles, choices, born that way. It's all of that combined in these conversations. And, and because we're involved in a cultural debate, again, there doesn't seem to be a definitive answer and that's really a result of kind of our postmodern cultural ideals that we really don't want to have a definitive answer. We don't want to have an absolute, a uniform idea, central standard to be held to, an absolute truth, if you will. Uh, that's just not, our, our culture has not just recently, it's a long time coming, trying to move those out of the conversation to where it's okay. Because you have your truth and I have my truth, right? And we're allowed to have our own truths. And, and really, it's kind of okay as long as my truth doesn't conflict with your truth. However, if my, conflict, my truth conflicts with your truth, then we have to debate and argue and fuss and fight, and I have to find some way to demean and de- you know, debilitate your truth in order for my truth to be true. Okay, that's, and just join Facebook. That's all I'm saying, all right? So <laughs> that's, that tends to be, again, the result of, which is why a lot of these questions are coming out, uh, that just really don't have, seem to have any actual definitive answers, just a lot of different answers. And so that's why we're talking about it um, as a church. Now, these are some scriptures that I read last week. This week, again, I'll read them, and next week, because it just kind of centers us in as to what it is we're doing and why we're doing it as a church. This is from uh, David. This is actually from what I've researched when he was a king, when he was King David over the Israelite nation. He actually wrote this in one of his Psalm 86. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. David seems to have an impression that there is you know, as we've maybe, you heard around church world, like God's ways may be different than our ways. You know, it's may, his ways are higher than our ways. His truth might not exactly align or be the same as my truth, right? And that David's saying, no, there's, there's this aspect of his ways, there's an aspect of his truth that I want to learn, that I want to get my life kind of in position uh, with. And again, that's, that's David falling in line with, look, there's a standard, there is a standard that's outside of me. And, and, and it's not hard to learn culturally that, 
you know, everybody in our culture, regardless of how they were raised and regardless of where they're from and regardless of where they currently state they are, there are certain things that, that people do and don't do in other countries and cultures, and you're like, that's wrong. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? That's, there's something about that's wrong. Well, that's not, a, that's not a decision that you made. Right? That's not something you constructed. There is a standard. There is a morality that's outside of you. There is, a, there is by which I would basically call a line and a measurement by which everything is measured. And Paul would write it this way in Romans 3.23. He, when he especially talked about sin, he said, look, everyone has sinned. Let's just read that, that word together. Four. What's the word? Everyone. everyone. You know what the Greek is for that? It means everyone. I just wanted you to know. Okay. Has sin. And we, what's the word? All fall short of God's glorious standard. I mean, there is a standard, there is a line, there is something by which we are all measured and we all fall short of it, yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous, declares that we meet that, that standard. And then it goes on to say, he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. Now again, this is a difficult thing. You have to get to a place where you at least are open to the idea that there is a measurement, that there is a standard by which you will be measured, you will be held in account. There is a truth that maybe isn't your truth. And when you fall in line with that, here's what Paul tells Timothy. Timothy is like a young apprentice pastor. And he says, look, this was going to happen. This is just the nature of how things go when you start talking about his truth, God's word, his truth. He says, uh, preach the word of God, his truth. That's my insertion there, just so you can use some of the language we're using. Preach the word of God, which is his truth. Be prepared, whether it's time is favorable or not. Look, it doesn't matter whether it's favorable to discuss it or not. Just talk about that. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage. Your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. And it goes on to say, they will follow their own desires and they'll look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They'll reject the truth and they'll chase after myth. And the ultimate statement here is that Paul's telling Timothy, look, when you, when you talk about um, his truth, when you talk about the word of God, when you preach this, when you teach this, here's what's going to happen, Okay. Now, some people are going to reject it, and some people are going to, to, uh, to accept it. But here's what's usually going to happen, these three things, right? You're going to be, it's going to correct, rebuke, and encourage. Now, I talked about this last week. This is usually something that doesn't just one thing happen. Usually, it's a combination of all three, right? It's like, I kind of figured that out, and so I'm going to be encouraged along the way. Uh, I'm going to be corrected, which is a little bit of kind of a tweaking, kind of like, well, you're, you might, you're slightly off, but we've got to tweak it just a little bit. Or rebuke, which nobody likes, right? Nobody likes to be told you're wrong, because that's, again, not postmodern in our culture, right? You can't tell me I'm wrong. Your, your face is wrong. Like, that's, that, that's what people, right? That's kind of our current, you know, reality. And it's like, no, rebuking is like, no, there's a truth, and, then, and, and what you're saying is not true. So it's, there's a rebuking there that it's, that it's wrong. And that is just a combination, again, of usually what happens. I always say this in terms of, look, when, when I'm teaching, I don't really care if you believe me. I don't care. I don't care if you believe me or trust me or, or listen to what I say and write it down and, and take it home. It matters so little to me. I want you to look at what his truth says. I want you to consider what his word says and actually be challenged to consider whether you believe that is true. Not whether I'm, what I'm saying and all the extra little fill-in that I do, what I'm saying is true. My, my goal and anything to do is just to bring that out and allow it to correct rebuke and encourage us, especially if we, when it comes to his word. And so that's going to be the case for all three weeks. And we know it's going to happen. And so I would challenge you today. This is a very polarizing conversation. Okay, Anything that has to do with the LGBTQ community has become that, not just in our culture, but also in the church. And so today what I would challenge you to do is look, don't leave halfway through the message. I just challenge you, don't leave halfway through the message. Don't take one thing I say and get stuck there. Just be open for the next 30 minutes and just be open to the conversation and see what God may or may not have to say as we read, okay, as we read his word and be challenged by that, not necessarily necessarily what I'm going to say, okay? All right, let's do that. So today, again, LGBTQ community, there are two basic forms of conversation happening, which we're going to try to address both. One is the cultural conversation, which has a lot to do with rights, has a lot to do with rights, has a lot to do with, again, kind of our postmodern thing where you can't tell me that I'm wrong and I can't tell you that you're wrong. Uh, and so, you know, you can't have rights that I don't have and I need to have rights that you have. And there needs to be a, a situation where rights prevail. And, and I understand from a legal, that's why everything's become a legal conversation in terms of rights, in terms of someone's rights to and someone's rights not to. And as long as my rights interfere with your rights, there should not be really a problem. 
All right? In the church, anyway, the conversation almost always, regardless of whether it starts with rights and ends with rights, it always comes back to a, to a particular conversation, which is, is it a sin? Okay? Is homosexuality, is transgender, is, is it a sin? Is it behavior, is it identity, whatever the case is, is it a sin? And usually the reason they want to have that conversation is because they've decided that if it is a sin, then you have to respond and act in one way, right? And that's several ways. Or if it's not a sin, then you have to respond and act another way. So we're going to try to look at both, both, both sides of the conversation. Let's start today from the church side of the conversation with whether or not it's a sin. Uh, where does sin come from, right? Who, who, who gets to decide what a sin is and isn't? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that. But I just want to read a few scriptures to you, and I have a bunch of references. There's a lot of scripture this morning. I have a lot of references up front. If you want to write them down and, and you know, look at them later on you know, on your own, uh, that's fine. But here's just one of the references that, that, that we can use in terms of 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 9. And it's a, or 6, sorry, 6 starting with verse 9. This is, a, this is one of those times in the scripture where it's like a list, right? There's a list of things, and sometimes that happens in scripture where it talks about sin. Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols, or commit adultery, or are male prostitutes, or practice homosexuality, keep going, or are thieves, or are greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, something usually happens when you read the scripture and, and there's a list, kind of a list of things, like a list of do's and do nots. Usually when you read those lists, you know, a couple things happen. One is you usually find one of the things that you really don't like. Right? You usually find one of the things that you find despicable and deplorable, and you usually find one of those things listed in there. The problem with that is you also usually find something that you're guilty of, right? And that's almost always the case. And it's like, dang it, why is that in one list together? I don't understand, right? There's always something, I, I, I hate that. I mean, it's just something rises in you. And then there's something you're like, oh, dang, I didn't know that was in there, right? That's, that's what usually happens. The other thing is that most of the time, sin, when it's described in these do not do's and do nots, they're usually all together. They're usually a list of some sort. Very rarely will you find one spoken of. I mean, Jesus has a few examples where he speaks of one specific thing, like, like unforgiveness, and the weight that that sin carries. So, he, you know, there's times where it's just one, one thing, but it's usually in a list. And most of the things that, that are listed or most of the things that are listed as, as a do and do not have other references. They can be cross-referenced throughout Scripture. Very rarely does somebody have one little verse that says something's wrong and there's nothing else to back that up, okay? Or, or something's right or something's wrong. So here's just a couple references for homosexuality, right? Listed as a sin. There's some Old Testament references there. The Mark references are when Jesus himself spoke about marriage. In the context of marriage, he talked about marriage and sex being this aspect of man and woman coming together in marriage, and that's what it was for. And then he basically says everything else, right, everything else is considered sin. Everything outside of that is considered sin. He didn't have to go and list homosexuality and incest and pedophilia. and He didn't have to go list them all. He, he just had to say, look, everything outside of this context, how I created it, it is considered sin. Uh, Romans, 1 Corinthians, of course, there's a couple more uh, passages in 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, Romans 1 is a big one. We'll come back to that in a minute. But Romans 1 is a big one. It uses all the words, fundamentalist love, like abomination and all that kind of thing. Like it uses big words when it's talking about homosexuality. 1 Timothy is another one. But that wasn't just satisfied. This is a cross-reference just for homosexuality. Let's go to some of the other ones that were in the list. Intoxication, right? Drunks. Right? All the other places, these are just a few places in Proverbs and Isaiah, Old Testament, New Testament, where it talks about the fact that you should not be drunk, you should not be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit, you should not drink, you should not drink yourself to the place and be unwise in your decisions. It's basically saying, look, there's a, there's a sin line here, and it's considered a sin if you are intoxicated. Keep going. This one's greed. Greed's another one, right? Greed has several references, talking about the love of money, talking about the, the trust we place in money, talking about the wrongful pursuit and actions when it comes to money, when it comes to just a greedy heart, all listed as, as a sin. Let's keep going. Oh, slander. This was in Romans 1 as well, but this is Roman. The slander is not a word we use very often. So just think of the word bad-mouthing, gossip, lying, hashtag Facebook, right? So that's, that's, what, that's what we're talking about in terms of slander. There's some Old Testament scripture there, <clears throat> some New Testament references where it talks about the lying tongue, the slander of someone else, the lying about someone else. All of this is considered a sin. All of this is a sin. And so when you start looking at, at, at those lists and you start talking about what is sin, you have to come to some conclusion as to whether or not, how you're going to define sin, how, how you, you and me, 
are going to define it, okay? And, and here's where I, I, I kind of come back with, with a visual I want to give you really quickly. And that is um, this visual of, um, of my truth Christians versus his truth uh, disciples. Now, my truth Christians um, have the Bible. So the Bible is very important. The Bible is a part of what they believe is true. Um, this is, everybody has to have a Bible and a study Bible. This is a chronological. This was the one my wife stole from me and I took back. So this is a chronological life application. You have to have a good life application study Bible in there. You have to have some books that you read that explain other things to you. Like there's a good doctrine book. Everybody needs a good doctrine book to figure out whatever doctrine is, right? So you got to figure that out. This is a book I read a long time ago, No Perfect People Allowed, helping me understand grace a little bit better and how that plays out in the church. And I got Bible studies that I've done that kind of helped me walk through how God made the earth and made us and kind of worked that out. But then I've got other things too. You know, I've got blogs that I can, I can read and print off and share with people. A Christian blogger this week talked about gay marriage, you know, the possibility of it being holy. Uh, and then another blogger wrote about how just, don't, you know, sh- her face is stupid. Don't listen to her. Like there's a couple, there's blogs like that, right? Here's the, the, the Charlotte Observer. A couple weeks ago, the Charlotte Observer wrote about seven articles throughout the Observer talking about HB2, talking about transgender issues and and, um, and uh, you know, just the, the, the abuse that's happened and some things that have happened along the way. So, you, you know, you got to fit that in somewhere. Let me fit it in over here. Um, you got that. Of course, I got my tablet. I like to watch YouTube videos on, right? So I've watched some YouTube videos about God and science and how certain things are and are not true. And, and then I've got my Facebook because, you know, all the wisdom that comes from Facebook on my phone, you know. That goes into this, this thing. Now, now, what this is, is that this is just, now this is just my bag, okay? Now, your, your tote bag's different, all right? But this is what we do. When you and I try to figure out what we believe sin is, is we allow God's word to have an influence, but then we also want everything else to help us make us feel better about what sin is and is not. Versus what I would call a his truth a disciple, which is God gets to define what sin is, and it's pretty darn clear. Now, we don't like this. Again, my truth is a little bit easier because I get to be concerned with uh, how it feels and how it looks and what happens with it. But, but, you know, his truth is just basically what he says regardless of what I feel about it. I can be honest with you. I've shared this with people myself. If, if it came to a list of sins, when it, if I had to write it, so many things would not be in there, right? <laughs> Gluttony would not be in there, <laughs> right? Unforgiveness, a lack of self-control or laziness, they would not be listed as sin. How many agree? Would you write a different list? Right. So when it comes to this, just understand, understand, when people are arguing, especially about the LGBTQ community and the, and the impact it has and the motives they have and the conclusions of what sin and sin is not, you have to be very careful about whether you are also dealing with your My Truth bag, whether you're a My Truth Christian, or whether or not you are a His Truth follower, His Truth disciple. Now, that's going to play itself out because, I'll be honest, most of the trouble we get into as Christians, most of the areas that we find to be the most tense, that we want to find a, a way to relieve the tension, is we convince ourselves of what might be true to us, and therefore we are just as guilty as everyone else, which is why you end up having arguments with somebody else. Because you don't understand that as a his truth disciple, I don't have to defend it. I didn't come up with the list of sins. He did. I don't have to defend that. But if it's my truth, I have to defend it. If it's my truth, I have to come after you and try to de- you know, demoralize your entire argument because it's my truth versus your truth. It doesn't matter whether Scripture's in my truth or not. We're, in this, we're on the same level in terms of arguments, in, the same, in terms of conversation. Now, people in the church have used their my truth Christians to do a lot of really ugly things in the name of Christ. Right? They've done a lot of things drawing conclusions they shouldn't draw, figuring out ways to kind of dumb down what's clear and try to, you know, try to explain away what's clear and try to guess at the unclear. And that's just the nature of who we are in terms of our, in terms of our, the my truth uh, Christians. Let me give you a quick example, quick example of when Jesus ran into this. We're going to take a break from the, the, the topic uh, in just a minute, but, but this is, this is just a moment in time. It's not uh, LGBTQ specific, but it's a time where Jesus ran into this with the Pharisees, and he wasn't a really big fan of how they were using the My Truth bag. He wasn't a real big fan. Now, this is, these are the people he was most harsh with, are the religious leaders, although they were the people he had the most in common with. 
I mean, the Pharisees were the most. Now, what you need to know about the Pharisees is the Pharisees upheld the law, all the law, the Mosaic law, the Levitical law, uh, the Ten Commandments. There were 614 laws. They were rules that were created to not break the rules that were created to not break the rules. Does that make sense? Okay, parents know what this is. Parents and youth leaders know what this is. The six-inch rule, I grew up in Baptist church. The six-inch rule and the no-dancing rule was the rules that followed the rules to make sure you didn't break the rule, right? Everybody knows what that is. That's what the Pharisees had done. The Pharisees run into Jesus and they try to basically pin him on some of their Levitical law. So here's, here's what they've got. Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus and then they asked him, because this is something that they had noticed. Why do your disciples disobey Our age-old tradition, there's a reason this is kind of written this way, Matthew's uh, recording. Our age-old tradition, these are the the Levitical laws that they had basically placed into a tradition. They ignore our tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. There was was some Levitical law, there was scripture that talked about ceremonial cleaning, and it had something to do with certain things, but the, but the, the Jewish people said, you know, it's just a good idea for everybody to do it. Let's just have everybody do it. And they said, look, it's heritage. We've been doing this for thousands of years. Like, this is a big deal. Why do you, as a rabbi, make your, your people aren't following that? You're not following our rules. So they go to this. And Jesus replied, and why do you, by your traditions, violate the direct commands of God? Like, why is it that your, your conclusions of, 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 of Scripture, why do they in turn actually violate a command that God's given? So he goes on to give the example. Instance, for instance, God says, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of the father and mother must be put to death. So honor your father and mother is part of the, what, Big Ten, right? Big Ten, Big Ten Commandments. The whole aspect of, you know, anyone who even speaks disrespectfully, that's in Deuteronomy when it explains a little bit of the, of the Ten Commandments. They must be then put to death. And he goes on to say this. But you say, it is all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I would have given you. This is one of those moments where they have found a loophole, right? They have found a law. They have found a a law, a Levitical law, scripture. They found scripture that said, oh, if we devote and vow everything to God, then we don't have to give it to anyone else because that would be robbing God, right? So they create this little, you know, Grand Cayman hedge fund around all their stuff, Right? And then they go to their mom and dad and go, oh, man, I really wish I could help you. I really do. But see, I vowed everything to God. So here's Jesus calling him out. And he says, look, by doing this, in this way, you say that you don't need to honor your father and mar- your, father and your parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. And he says, you, what's the word? Hypocrites. Yeah, say it one more time like you actually like you've been wanting to say it for a while. You ready? You that's right. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Now listen, Jesus doesn't like it when we use his scripture, his father's word. And twist it to get out of doing something he called us to do. Or drawing a conclusion that he that is actually contrary to what the word of God tells us. But that's the problem. Listen, that's the trouble we get into when it's our my truth bag. Right? Listen, this is the conversation I, 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 around the LGBT community. Here's the conversation I have most often. Well, Matt, I've been reading a lot. and I, Listen, I just can't call it a sin. I just can't call it a sin. And I'm like, okay. okay. And they have reasons for it. And they've, 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 they've tried to figure out their truth in terms of why it is they can't call it a sin. And then I basically say, yeah, but does the Bible call it a sin? Well, you know, I guess technically, maybe, and in some circumstances, maybe within the context, certain things are listed and I mean, okay, okay. Like, it doesn't matter. Again, it doesn't matter to me. I'm not going to be the judge of you. It doesn't matter to me whether you care if you call it a sin or not. The question is, you have now created a truth, you've now created a a situation where it's your truth at stake, and then you, as a Christian, are going to start telling people this. And that's where you're in trouble. Because my truth Christians have spent a lot of time doing a lot of things that people should never have ever done. We have enslaved people with verses. 
okay? The KKK would pin it on their cloaks as they brutally assaulted and murdered people. Okay, the Jews, God's people, were enslaved and tortured because of a few verses that people found twisted and applied. Now, I know that's the extreme, but I'm telling you, we have very dangerous ground to walk on when you start figuring out what your truth is and start passing that off as what God says. What God says is pretty darn clear. Now, I may not understand it all the time, which is why I do a lot of studying, right? I've been studying more the last decade, especially on this topic of the LGBTQ community. I've been studying more the last decade than I have the first 30 years of my life. But it wasn't in order to figure out if it was true. It didn't have anything to do with whether or not God called it a sin. It had to do with, well, Why? Why did he call it a sin? What's at stake? What's the problem? What's actually happening? How can I be a productive member of this conversation? But it wasn't as to whether or not it was true or not. It had nothing to do with whether or not it was a sin. It had nothing to do with what I had to be called to do as a follower of Christ. It had nothing to do with that. The other aspect of this is that this, our truth draws conclusions to something that was never there. Well, it's a sin. Therefore... I cast judgment. Therefore, I'm allowed to feel this way. Therefore, I'm allowed to say these things. Therefore, I'm allowed to do those things. And it's completely not in Scripture. It is completely, honestly, absent from the heart of God. But we are all guilty of it. It doesn't matter what your deal is. It matters, it matters the fact that you are still creating a my truth argument versus being a his truth follower, a his truth disciple. I have conversations with people all the time. Well, Matt, how can you, how can you, I mean, how can, how can you say that and not say this because it still casts judgment? And I say, no, 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 you have to understand, judgment's a big deal for me. Like, like Romans 1, remember Romans 1, we talked about Romans 1. Romans 1 has all those, has a ton of sins listed, has all those big words everybody loves to jump back to, and it talks about homosexuality, and, you know, they believed a lie, and they turned to themselves, and they got all this kind of language there. Do you know what Romans 2 says? Because nobody, nobody reads Romans 2 after they read Romans 1. Paul hasn't even taken a breath. Here's Romans 2. You may think you can condemn such people, but you're just as bad. And you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished. Let's just pause for a minute. How many people have heard Christians say this before in terms of, in terms of gay people and homosexuals and transgender? Yeah. When you say they're wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge others do the very same things. Again, listening all those lists in, in, in Romans 1. He wasn't talking specifically about that tip for tat. He's saying, look, you are guilty of the sin. You are guilty of the sin that fills this world. And he goes on to say, and we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. God's got it covered. Don't worry about it. It's not up to you to punish people. Since you judge others for doing the things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Another version says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Kindness, tolerant, and patient. How many of you would describe Christianity as that way to everyone who's not a Christian? Everyone who's not a Christian, right? Kind, tolerant, patient. Matt, here's the problem. I get this. This is the, cover, this is the number one conversation I have with people. All right. If I am kind and tolerant and patient and loving, because that's another big command of Jesus, right? And loving, they're going to think I approve of what they're doing. Like people are going to assume that I condone this behavior. If I'm kind and tolerant and patient, I know God is, but if I'm that way, I don't know what to do. And there's a tension there, I understand. But Jesus addressed it. I just want you to understand. Jesus very clearly addressed it. Jesus was known. Known for hanging out with a bunch of people that, wasn't like him, that weren't like him at all. And the people that weren't like him at all liked him, right? And he was known for, for he, was, he was labeled as, 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 a, as a friend of, you know what a friend is? Someone who loves and condones and approves, right? He was labeled as a friend of 
tax collectors and sinners, which I think is hilarious that tax collectors got their own category, right, <laughs> in the Jewish culture. But listen, this is, this is big. You know, I think if we were to rewrite that today, the fundamentalists would say with homosexuals and sinners. Because we've created our own category for it. That's their own kind of sin. The LGBTQ fits over here, and yeah, the drunkards and the liars and the cheats and the adulterers, they all fit over here. Right? So, so here's what we've done. And here's what Jesus says. This is Jesus, in retrospect, talking about himself. He says, look, the Son of Man, on the other hand, he's talking about the difference between him and uh, uh, John the Baptist. He said, the other, the other hand, he feasts and drinks. And you say he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. This is what people were labeling Christ as. And then here's 10 words that explain it. But wisdom is shown to be right by its results. Jesus says, look, I understand what people call me. I understand what people say. I understand that it's, that it's a tension that you live in. But wisdom is shown right by its results. Do you know what that means? It means this. It means that time will reveal wisdom by the result of our actions and not the prediction of them. Stop worrying so much about what you think it will communicate. Stop worrying so much about what you're worried that it will you know, translate to. Stop worrying about what you feel like people will say about you if you are kind, tolerant, gentle, patient, loving, and understanding of people that you don't, there's nothing like you, that you don't understand. Remember we talked about last week with racism, that the, that the further you are away, away from something, right, the simpler it looks. But the closer you get, the closer you get, it's more complex, isn't it? It's more complex. Because, you know, it's, it's different when your brother or your sister say they're gay. It's different when your kid comes to you and says they're having feelings and thoughts, right? It's way different. And, that, that, and if we're not careful, we'll go to our my truth bag and try to figure out an answer. I was saying, no, 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 God's got it covered. God's got it covered. Matt, the people argue with me. Matt, how can you say Journey Church would welcome, you know, uh, gay and homosexual couples to come into our church? How can you say that you can do that and still preach that it's a sin? <laughs> I can. Watch me, Right? Like, watch me. I will never not do that. Why? Because it's a sin. I didn't come up with a sin list. If they feel judged by what God says, that's fine. I'm judged by what God says. I care about whether they're judged by you and me. And if they can't distinguish the difference, that is where the Holy Spirit comes in and takes care of it. Okay? Because the reality for you and me is this. We, we have an obligation to love the way Christ loved. We have an obligation, right? Matter of fact, I'll read, I'll read this verse. I'll read this verse in Romans 13. Again, we looked at Romans a lot today, but here's Paul saying, towards the end, let no debt remain outstanding except the continued debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and I love this last part, and whatever other commandments they may be, right? That's like article, that's like Amendment 9 for amendments, isn't that right? It's like, look, there's going to be other stuff listed, I didn't give you all just in this quick moment, I'm telling you, whatever other ones there are, he goes on to say, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm no harm to a neighbor. And Jesus spent a great deal of time telling us who our neighbors were, didn't he? Talking about the, Samar the good Samaritan. Didn't he have a good little, little bit of a say into what our neighbors look like? That do nothing like us. Matter of fact, we're anti-us. Love does no harm to a neighbor. When Jesus said, I have a new command for you, love others as much as I have loved you, it gets hard. It gets hard in my truth. You want to know Why? You know what, let me just share this with me. You know, you know what I struggle with in the My Truth bag? Me, this is Matt, your, your pastor. You know what I struggle with in the My Truth bag? That when I read the prodigal son, no, I'll just, just, I'll just make the statement. What I struggle with here is that when I think of my gay neighbors, that Jesus loves them as much as he loves me. That's hard for me. That's hard for my truth bag. Why? Because I'm a pastor. I'm like a lieutenant or something, right? And like the, and like the pecking order. I've been serving him my whole life. But you know what? I don't, it doesn't take me much to read the prodigal son and to read about the two sons and to see that the father's love was the same for the son who never went anywhere 
to the son who is dead to him for so long? His love was the same. The only difference was I received his love. I'm there. I've already been a recipient of it. And now I am required, I am obligated to share as much as he loves me with everyone else. That, that, that's, that, it doesn't get any simpler than that. So when it comes to being a my truth Christian and, and, or a his truth disciple, this is what the process of sanctification is. Okay? The big process of sanctification is every day, I'm trying to become a whole lot less of a my truth Christian and a whole lot more of a his truth follower. That's what becoming more and more like Jesus is all about. Not leaning on my own understanding or how I feel about it and trying to lean into what he said and just trust that absolute truth that was given to me. That's, that's what it's about. That's where it comes out for us, especially in this conversation. Now, this is a question that I heard. I'll close with this. This is a question that I heard. In, um, from a pastor named Andy Stanley. You saw him on the clip last week. It's a question that he, he, he posed one time, and it just bothers me. It bothers me for specific topics, and this is one of them. And it's basically this. When it comes to the LGBTQ community and the issues that it creates in our culture, what does love require of me? What does the love that Jesus gave me, and I've received it, what does it require of me in every conversation, in every thought, and in every engagement? What does it require of me? So look, I don't, I don't know if I have the issue for HB2, okay? It doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't, I mean, you know, we'll talk about some of that next week. But, you know, if um, uh, McCrory stays in and it stays in and it's a constant debate, nothing changes for what love requires of me to do and engage in that conversation. If Cooper's elected and, and, uh, and repeals it like he's promising to do, guess what? Nothing changes when it comes to what love requires of me, Right? doesn't matter who's elected uh, as president. Nothing changes, okay? Everything that we, we fight about as Christians, the equality of marriage, and if it's a supreme level thing or a state thing, and it doesn't matter if it gets repealed or if it continues on or they remove marriages from churches altogether. Guess what? Nothing changes when it comes to what love requires of me in my conversation and in my issues and in my thing. So here's what I want you to do. The next time, before you jump on Facebook and add your two cents, right? Before you engage in that conversation with that person, that I'll be honest with you, I struggle. You know, I've met some very, 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 very um, aggressive, aggressive and angry LGBTQ kind of agenda-driven people. And it's a little hard for me because I'm just like you. I rise up and my truth bag comes out and I want to, you know. That's what, I, that's what I want to do. But I'm telling you, when you begin to ask the question, you know what, what does, what does the love of Christ that I've received require of me in this moment? Because it's not, it's, not, it's not the truth of God's word. I was raised as a Baptist kid, man. We sang militant songs as a kid about the army of God and like champions for God. And we always told as a kid to defend the word of God, to defend it. I don't have to defend it. You know, the best way to defend the word of God is to live it out. Right? The best way to defend the word of God is to live it out, right? And make, and make it, oh, oh, what I find more of us guilty of is we take the beautiful light of Christ, as John 1 describes him. It's the light of Christ that draws people in, and we turn into a flamethrower and just destroy everything. <laughs> and it all changes when we start asking little questions like that. Hey, in this conversation with this person whose son is gay, this conversation with this person who who's, who's feels like the most antagonistic person towards the church and what I believe, what does love require of me in this moment? It will change how you respond. It will change the way you love. And it will at least challenge you to at least figure out, am I working from a my truth bag of what I believe is true and convicted about? Or am I moving into a place where it's a his truth? I'm a his truth follower. I may not be able to answer all the questions, but I know what the word of God says about it. And I'd love to be able to walk down this path of you. I'm not going to worry about what, the, we're gonna, what people will predict about my actions of loving you looks like. I'm going to let wisdom and time show its results. I'm going to let wisdom and time be the judge of how things are actually going to turn out. And if only one person, listen, if only one person understands that they can come to our church 
And they can be a part of these conversations. They can be a part of our worship. And they can be a part of discovering what God has to say about who they are, about how valued and loved they are. If just one of them comes to a, a, a faith in Jesus, to put their life in Jesus, I don't know how to solve all the other issues. Understand me. I don't know how to solve it, but it wasn't my job to solve it either. I could also read in the Word of God how he is the one who sanctifies. He is the one who changes hearts. And he is the one who is the answer when we don't have answers. I think I wrote it in my blog this week that, you know, the biggest problem the church has is we're trying to fix everything, right? We're trying to fix everybody's gayness, right? And I don't know if you don't like that word, but I'm just telling you, that's, that's, that's what I see happening in the church. We're just trying to fix it all. Just like I'm trying to fix your marriage and your adultery and your anger and your lying and your so and so on. I'm trying to fix that. I'm telling you, you don't have problems. You don't have a solution for all those other things either. You just think you do. It is only the Spirit of God that changes hearts, period. And it's the love and it's the support of a community of followers that allows me to enter into even wanting the Spirit of God to do a work in my life. And that's what we're called to be. And that's what we're called to do. Let's pray together this morning. God, I'm so thankful for your word just the way that it does. It does correct us. It does rebuke us. It does encourage us. And God, the mixture of that this morning, I'm praying, God, that your spirit's doing a work. God, that for all of us, we're just guilty. I'm guilty of leaning too often in what I've collected to be my truth than simply just trusting your truth. So God, I pray as... As David prayed, I pray that we as a church would pray, as David prayed, that, that, that God, that you would teach us your ways and that we would align our lives to follow your truth and we would become your truth disciples and your truth followers above and beyond anything else. God, I pray that this would change at least some of the conversation that's being had with and around the issues that come with the LGBTQ community. And God, may, may the kindness that you show us every day in our sin, the kindness, the tolerance, and the patience that you show us be something that we reflect as we love others as much as you love us. And we pray all that because it's only by your spirit, God, it's only by your power that we can do it in and through you, Jesus.